everybody. Ferris Wicks here. Thank you for joining us uh, for another uh, live draw and chat. So uh, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, told you I was Maris Wicks, but I'm an author and illustrator of comic books about science. I illustrated and wrote this book, which is all about coral reefs and kind of global ocean health. Um, today we're going to be talking about mammals. I have been trying to focus on uh, some hometown critters. I know the first couple of draws we did more Caribbean coral reef. Uh, last a couple weeks ago we did squids and octopuses and cuttlefish. And yeah, I thought it'd be fun if we like talked about some of our mammal friends. This is not a real seal, but this is my little my little fluffy seal friend. Um, so we're gonna talk and draw harbor seals and fur seals, two very different types of seals. And then we're gonna head out into the ocean. Um, like way further out to Stellwagen Bank, and we're going to draw some humpback whales and some right whales. Um, so before we get started, I just want to let you know that I'm a mammal too. Uh, all humans are mammals. And uh, I like to think of myself as a marine mammal when I'm in the ocean, but I'm, I'm more of a ter terrestrial mammal. I like walking on the land. But uh, mammals have some characteristics that they all have in common, that they all share. So if you're a mammal, you're warm-blooded, um, you have hair, uh, and you might look at a whale and be like, wait, this whale doesn't have any hair. But a lot of whales, when they're born, have hair kind of like around their face, and it's kind of like as thick as your pinky finger, um, and it falls off as they get older. Uh, so warm-blooded, hair, um, give milk to their young, and give birth to live young. And, oh, there's another one in there. Oh, breathe air. And there's a lot of animals and other different groups that have one of those characteristics, but those are the five things that kind of make mammals mammals. And then there's some rule breakers. Well, you know, the platypus. I don't like to talk about the platypus, but they lay eggs. Monotremes are their own special thing. I could do a whole different episode on monotremes. But yeah, so, and I wanted to talk about marine mammals just because uh, I'm based outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I live near the coast, and they are animals that are not necessarily in my backyard because I don't live that close to the ocean, but they're animals that are local uh, inhabitants, and all of the animals we're going to be talking today, except for the fur seals, are local marine mammals. So uh, I'm going to just show you what I'm using to draw today because I get questions about that. Oh, and also, if you have questions during the live draw, please feel free to ask them in the comment section, and um, we can chat about whatever you want, questions about art, questions about nature, questions about science. Um, I am not a... Uh, academically trained scientist, but I spent over 20 years in informal education. Uh, I worked at the aquarium for eight years as an educator, um, and now I'm a full-time writer and illustrator. But I'm sharing my screen today with you, and I'm going to be drawing on a Wacom tablet. This just plugs into the USB port, and it has a stylus, and I draw on this. You can't see anything because it's kind of like a mouse pad, and then I'm sharing my screen, and I'm drawing in Photoshop. Um, this isn't my favorite way to draw. It's uh, not the most natural. I really like to draw on pencil and paper, but it's a lot harder for me to set up that to share with you digitally. So for these live draws, I draw digitally just because it makes it easier for me to share my drawings with you. Um, I am going to be doing this a little bit differently today because I'm going to be using my imagination more. I did a little bit of homework and looked at some pictures of these animals before, but I'm going to kind of use my memory to think about what they looked like in the pictures and then draw my versions. So the drawings I'm doing today are inspired by real life, but I am definitely going to be flexing my cartoon muscles uh, drawing them. So let's head over to my drawing board and we can all get started. Um, and I have my screen just blank blank paper or blank blank file call it paper um on the right hand side of over here we've got body shape fins or limbs mouth eyes patterns and behavior and these are the big things that i think about when i'm going to draw an animal um there is no right or wrong way to draw what we're drawing today i'm just sharing with you the way that i like to do it um and also if you don't feel like drawing today you can totally you know sculpt or write a poem or even just like hang out and watch me draw because I love to watch other people draw it's like mesmerizing um but again this is just for funsies like you know we're not getting greeted or anything like that so we're going to start with harbor seals um I know I'm like not supposed to have favorites <laughs> but I love harbor seals uh and part of it is because did you I just they look I'm not supposed to touch them but like this is why I have the stuffed animal I just want to hug them so if you like have that urge to stuffed animal, uh, it is against the against the law to actually uh, touch and interact and bother marine mammals. So part of the huggability of the harbor seal, I think for me, comes from they're just like 
adorable sausage-shaped body. So we're going to start with just kind of like a sausage oval. And I'm going to do a profile view this time. I, I talk sometimes about drawing like a line down the middle and a line across just to get the, where the center of the animal is. Um, so we'll do a profile view, a front view, and then we'll do like kind of a side three quarters. So that's, we're done, right? That's it. Maybe I can give a little face. Okay, it's a seal. No, just kidding. It's not done. <laughs> um, but they're an animal that you can look at their body shape, and when they're swimming, a lot of times they pretty much just look like a swimming seal nugget, and it's like the best. Um, on the sides, we've got, sorry, I'm just, I know I'm supposed to do this side first. Um, we've got kind of a face area here, and then we'll have the seal's front flippers kind of tucked into their body and then back flippers sideways. And right now you're only gonna really see just a little bit of the back flippers. And general shapes, um, this is a little tricky because we're doing it through the side, but kind of just like a little arrowy. They're like a little torpedo shaped. We've talked about that kind of body shape before where like it's not just a circle, there is some hydrodynamic, um, and hydrodynamic just means that it passes easily, flows easily through the water. There are some hydrodynamic shapes here. Um, so let's get into the face. I'm going to zoom in here. And one of the other kind of cute factors that I feel like, and a lot of times people gravitate towards harbor seals, is because a lot of times th their face looks a bit like a, a puppy's face or a dog's face. They have a very, like, Labrador Retriever-like face. So we're going to go in and just do a little, a little seal face in there. And I'm going to... They've got really cool nostrils. Um, seals can voluntarily open and close their nostrils. So our nostrils are just open all the time, breathing air, not even really thinking about it. But since seals spend a lot of their time under the water, they won't want to get any water in their nose because that doesn't feel good. I mean, I hate getting water up my nose. So they actually like shut their nostrils like that. And then you can watch them. If you, if you see them come out of the water, their nostrils open and then shut again. They can actually like open and pull them shut, which is a really cool thing about seals, I think. Um, and if you are interested in a lot of for, for the research that I did for this, I literally just Googled harbor seals and looked at image searches. And uh, I think the New England Aquarium and a number of other aquariums and zoos have uh, videos on their YouTube pages of these animals swimming in the water. I know for the New England Aquarium, I found a pretty great video of the fur seals kind of playing underwater. Um, so I've got a little snout there. And again, like we zoom out, it's not a very big part of the seal. But the face on animals, and I've mentioned this before, the face is kind of where we look to on animals um, to let us know, uh, you know, what they what they look like or to identify. And as humans, we do it with people too. Like a lot of times when you look at another person, the first thing you look at is their face because that's how we kind of read each other. So I think we also have a innate uh, like desire to also look at other animals' faces. And it gets a little tricky because like sometimes I look at a worm and I'm like, hi, I, I don't actually know which end is your face, but I still like you, you're great. Like, I think worms are awesome, but I think it's a little harder uh, to kind of commune with a worm than it is for a seal. That's just me. I'm not like, it's not scientifically accurate. Let's get some eyes on the seal. And harbor seals have pretty good sized eyes. Um, that just allows them to look, obviously. But if you think about it, looking underwater, your eyes are differently adapted. Think about when you're in a pool or in a pond and you try and open your eyes underwater. Is it clear or blurry? It's pretty blurry. And if you're in salt water, it like does not feel good because it stings. Um, our eyes are not adapted to see underwater, but a lot of the animals that live in the ocean, uh, especially if they can go above and below, like seals, are adapted. And they're adapted to be on land as well, but water is where, where they're going to be catching most of their food. Um, so they want to have really good eyesight underwater. Uh, harbor seals do not have visible ear flaps. They have kind of like a little tiny hole on the side. So if you want to get real technical, we can like put our little seal ear hole on the side. Um, you don't have to, it kind of looks like a dimple at this point. Um, and the other thing that's really important about seals that I sometimes leave off when I'm cartooning them are their whiskers. And it's because I find that whiskers are sometimes hard to draw because in real life they're almost translucent and they don't, like when I'm drawing them on uh, a drawing like this, they're, they're black lined. But I feel like, I'll draw some on the side. Some little whiskers. Um, and I, 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 it's, it's sometimes hard, it's harder for me to put them on my drawing because I feel like it obscures their face. Um, whiskers are like 
one of the most important parts of being a seal because they are super sensitive and they can sense if the water is murky or dark, they can sense movement and the whiskers help them to catch their food. So, oh, look at this little blubber friend. I love this seal. Um, I'm going to draw from the front view now. And this is, I think, uh, challenging for me to draw just because a lot of animals in the ocean we're used to seeing from the side. And when you look at them from the front, they can look very different. Um, it's similar for people, too, if you draw someone in profile versus draw them for straight on. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell uh, that it's the same person. So I am going to roughly draw the same shape here, but thinking of it like looking at it front on. So we've got a flipper out there, a flipper out there, and our eyes. So our face is going to be right around there. And I'm going to zoom in again because it's just a little bit easier for me to move this a little bit too. Um, and a lot of the lines that I make when I'm doing this are just kind of guidelines. So I might erase them. And erasing does not mean that you made a mistake. It just means that you're working on your drawing. A lot of times erasing is just as important as making marks when you're drawing. Um, and I feel like that kind of, that for me, especially when I was younger, helped me kind of see the process of drawing a little bit better. Because like not every line we're going to make is perfect. Sometimes you're just like, oh, I don't really like the way that line looks. And this is probably going to happen a little bit with, with the face. So we'll get some nice little eyes in there. And then I'm kind of doing like looking at where the nose is and then figuring out where the lines are from there. Just got a little bit, let's see. And their mouth pretty much just looks like the number three turned on its side. Um, a lot of times if I, if I can look at an animal and uh, kind of think about the shapes that make up that animal really simply. Like even sometimes I think of like letters of the alphabet or numbers and I'm like, oh, uh, we talked about this when we were drawing Barracuda about a month ago that they have a tail that's shaped like a V um, and kind of looking at those those shapes. And again, like that's something that's up on my up on my list. So I feel like, I feel like that's pretty good. I might draw a couple lines on the side just to suggest that their face is sticking out a little bit. Um, and we'll do those whiskers. And the way that I drew this is kind of like I drew for a model sheet. So you might, if you ever, if you like cartoons and if you ever looked at development stuff, a lot of times um, a model sheet is basically the that that character in a bunch of different poses. So I'll have a front view and a side view. Um, so I want to draw a bit more of a dynamic seal next. So I'm going to shrink these friends and put them up at the top because they'll be my reference. Um, but I want to draw a seal in their banana pose because it's one of my favorites and it's also another way to think about shapes. And then I want to draw one underwater because I feel like that's one of the things that we most, I feel like a lot of times if you see seals at the aquarium, you'll see them up above or you'll see them swimming below. And I feel like it's really cool to see them swimming in the water because they're so incredibly graceful. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like my mind is just like when they're out, when they're up above land, I feel like it's the reverse, right? Like I could be graceful on land, but when I get in the water, I can like swim around a little bit. But my body's not adapted to swim in the water. But for seals, I see a harbor seal and I'm like, oh man, being on land seems like it's kind of tricky because you have to like blub along a little bit. But as soon as they get in the water, they just like effortlessly glide. It can turn on a dime. And I think it's really cool to see animals in the habitat that they're very adapted to be in. So banana pose you might see on land. And it is pretty much like a banana. So think about a banana shape and draw that banana shape. Now, in this case, our banana is going to be a little bit pointier at one end than the other end because one end is the head and one end is the tail. So I'm going to make that side a little bit bigger. Um, and a lot of times if you see seals uh, just chilling, hanging out, this is a pose that they might be in. So we'll get our, our back flippers, got a little tail more back flippers, and their, their back is shaped a little bit like a big wide V, or almost like a W. Um, and then we've got one flipper down here. And if you look closely at um, harbor seal flippers, they have like nails or claws at the end of their flippers, which is kind of a cool, a cool like, seal thing. Um, and the harbor seals that I also think about the aquarium is the there the exhibit is right out front so you don't actually have to go into the main building like everybody who's walking near the aquarium can see these seals which is kind of a neat a neat thing so we just have them 
be there as part of part of the harbor lock. Um, since the seal is lying on the ground, I'm going to make the bottom a little flatter so you get a sense of um, weight of the seal because gravity is a thing. I don't always like it. Gravity is kind of a pain in the butt, if you ask me. Um, here you came. You came to draw. You came here to draw seals, and then you, then you hear me complain about gravity. I'm like, oh, gravity's the worst. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that Earth's gravitational pull keeps us like you know from floating away into space. But just sometimes I wake up and I'm like, oh, why does gravity seem extra today? And that it's part of it. I think has to do with the fact that we've had some pretty like damp and muggy weather the past few days. So I'm just like, oh. but enough. It's fine. I don't mind. Gravity's great. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna be a little silly with my cartooning here. And I would like to just like have the seal with like a little pensive, a little, a little, they don't actually move their flippers like this, but I thought it would be kind of fun to give the seal a little bit more attitude. And this is part of what I love doing with cartooning is uh, I'm often giving animals kind of a little like human quality or very cartoony qualities. And for me, it's just really fun. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, about what it must be like to be a seal or a worm or a fish for the work that I do. Um, just because I think that's part of understanding how animals survive on this planet is trying to think about what it's like to be that animal. Like what would it be, what would it feel like to swim a mile in seal flippers? Cause they don't wear shoes. So I couldn't say walk a mile in seal shoes. Um, but I think it's a good exercise to really think about, you know, how do these animals get their food? How do they stay protected from predators? Um, what do they do for fun? Like, what do they do when they're just chilling? And when I say for fun, um, play and fun is like a huge part of animals' lives that raise their young. Um, if you watch um, seals and uh, dolphins as well, you'll watch the parents play with their kids and like get them to encourage, like, like basically training to catch food. So I think I think that type of play is really cool to observe and think about. Because um, like honestly, some of it's gotta just like like maybe sometimes it just feels awesome to be a seal. Well, you know when whales breach and they're like jumping out of the water? I know there's a couple different theories as to why they do that, but like one of those theories is just like because they feel like it or because it feels cool. And I think that's enough of a reason. And you can think about stuff that you like to do too. Maybe there's something that you like to do and you just like don't know why. Like that's the kid and I still do this now. I used to just love to lay on my belly in the grass and look for anything like ants. I just loved doing it. And like, part of it can probably get chalked up to watching Honey, I Shrunk the Kids when I was a kid. And I like was obsessed with the scene when they ride the giant ant. And I was like, I want to be tiny and ride a giant ant. Um, but I think it's important to think about like what you like to do and why. Um, and then you can seek out more things to do that are like that. Maybe we'll have a seal. I feel like the seal maybe needs to, we'll give it some. This is one of the fun things about playing around with drawing, right? Like you can just make it very silly um and again i think it's i've done this before where i just like i'll i'll print out a blank uh head for a character and i'll just like keep drawing the face differently to practice expressions um and it's it's just fun so i think the seal should be being like oh hello i heard the fish this time of year are delicious um anyways so there's our seal and banana pose a little silly a little cartoony um Maybe maybe they're wiggling their back back flippers, their back tail a little bit, so we'll draw some motion lines. And I think the last seal that I would like to draw for the harbor seals is some action pose of swimming underwater looking for food. And in this case, um, watching videos of seals swimming really helped me because I can think about how their body moves in the ocean when they're swimming. And it's, it's I mean, even I'm, I'm kind of like always thinking about not just their body on the outside but thinking about their skeleton on the inside so in order to move in the water when you see them you're like wow their spine bends a lot um so i'm going to think of a seal on a dive and to do that i'm going to draw a pose where it kind of looks like it's a little bit of a raindrop but there's a little bit more motion to it it's not just coming down i'm doing this one kind of tiny just because I feel like I feel like I really need just like a giant piece of paper, but I'll have to do this for now. So I've got some flippers in the back and head in the front. And this is going to be a little similar to our, and it can be as simple as like that for your for your face. Um, I'll go in a little bit with a nose in a second because um, I think right now it does kind of 
look a little silly um, and might not be as a seal. So we'll go back in and make that nose stick out just a little bit. And we want to have them looking at something. So maybe, maybe there's a fish down here. Give the seal some. And this fish is maybe surprised a little bit. There's been a lot of surprise prey here. Well, um, the other thing that I might do for a drawing like this, I can move the seal down a little bit, um, is if this seal just went on a dive, I could draw the trail of bubbles that would have been trapped by its body from the air. And you can, here, I'll, it's gonna, but you can also do kind of like motion lines that follow the seal. And that can help add it's, I mean, it's, it's not a drawing that's moving. It's a stationary drawing, but thinking about animals in motion um, can help you, can help you kind of think about what, what is it like for them? And I think I maybe, this part I'm gonna change a little bit. Again, sometimes it's just like looking and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I, that part looks too interesting. Um, and then one of my other favorite seal poses is I think it's called bottling when they just like chill in the water and they just look like a big floating seal buoy. Um, and this is kind of another fun way to draw a seal that's kind of front on. And again, a lot of this is just from watching the seals at the aquarium for hours. Um, I would also take my sketchbook and draw in front of the seal exhibit. Um, but right now what I'm doing is staying at home a lot. So I, again, looking at videos online and fit photos online have been a more helpful thing to do for me because I can't can't go to my favorite places, but I can still find cool resources. Yeah, we'll do a little, little closed eyes, a little happy seal. Looks like Bob Ross, a little happy seal on there. Um, now, does anybody have questions so far about anything that we've talked about today or um, herbicides seals or drawing? Um, again, feel, please, please feel free to an ask those questions in the comment section and I can take them. Um, we have one question from Sarah who asked, are you drawing from memory or do you have pictures of seals around you to draw inspiration from? So the question is, am I drawing from memory or do I have pictures? So usually we have pictures and today I actually front loaded all of my, like I looked at pictures. So I'm drawing from memory of the pictures and I, I'll show you, I actually have a cheat sheet. Um, cause when I do this, a lot of times I'm thinking about what I'm going to draw, but I also have a couple topics I like to, to mention. So this is my, this is my tiny post-it <laughs> that literally just says Harbor Seal, um, blubber. Oh, I didn't talk about blubber yet. Uh, holes for ears, fish, shellfish, and crabs. Um, and I've got it for the other ones as well. But yeah, I, I'm mostly working from memory, but I did look at a bunch of pictures right before we started. For seals, I'm pretty comfortable with drawing them um, just because, well, I feel like their shape is simple, but at the same time, I have looked at them a lot, like I said, so I can kind of like pull them out of my brain library. Uh, for right whales, which I'm gonna draw later, right whales are, they are very different looking than a lot of the other whales I'm used to. So I had to do a little bit of um, research before. But generally when I'm doing this, I have a picture right next to me and or a bunch of pictures either on my computer or I have a lot of books because I, I love books. Um, but drawing from photos for drawing all the nature stuff and bio stuff that I do, I'm generally always using photos as a reference or videos. Um, like for a lot of the swimming stuff, I'll find a YouTube video and I'll even like stop it at certain points, almost like making a comic of them mid swimming and screen grab those so that I have a re reference to see what their body is doing. Um, Cause in the beginning I was like, wait, I couldn't remember if like how for, uh, Harbor seals moved in the water versus fur seals. So we'll talk about how different fur seals are just adaptation wise. But I couldn't remember if they actually used their fins or if they used their tail more for swimming. So that was something where I, I, I went online and, and, and they, they do both, um, but not to the same power that the fur seals do. And we'll see that, see that in a second. Um, any other questions? Okay, go. So we're gonna move away from our fur seals um, I'm sorry, our harbor seals, and we're going to jump to fur seals. So fur seals are uh, another one of the seals that are at the aquarium. Um, they are not native to New England. They do not live around here. They actually live in a lot colder climate. They can be found um, in Alaska, northern Canada, and Russia. So very, very cold place. Oh, and I, I didn't mention this, but 
part of why harbor seals are so spectacularly uh, like chonky is because they rely on blubber for insulation. Their fur itself is not a very good insulator. Blubber is their main source. And that, you know, you, if you've been swimming in New England, even in the summer, it can be pretty chilly in the ocean. So you want to have a good, a good source of insp uh, inspiration, good source of insulation. I mean, both of those are good. Um, but especially in the winter, like think about how cold the ocean is in the winter. It's chilly. But for fur seals, they have a different uh, uh, technique for insulation, and it's fur. So I think they have the second densest fur coat of any mammal. I think the only one that has a denser coat is a uh, sea otter. And we'll look a little bit when we start drawing the fur seals, uh, how their bodies are different from the harbor seals and the special adaptations they have to survive. So first things first. Fur seals spend a lot more time out of the water than harbor seals. So their bodies are adapted to move on land and in the ocean. So a lot of times I kind of think of them as the initial body shape is one oval and then another kind of pointy oval that's intersecting. And bottom oval that's laying on the ground, it's kind of like the back half, and then this is going to be the, the top half. And I'll zoom in a little bit because that will make it easier to see, I think. Um, they also have really, really long flippers. And when they go on land, their flippers actually turn um, like that. Now the first, the harbor seals, when they go on land, their flippers kind of stay tucked to the side of their body. So I'm just basically drawing like two kind of flappy, they almost look like duck feet, um, like cartoony duck feet, but this is their front flippers. So they've got the front there, and then their back will sometimes kind of fold up like an upside down V. And I'm gonna tighten that up a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna erase a little bit of our lines here, just our little oval guidelines. And then we're gonna go up to the head. So they've got a bit more of a pointy face, but still kind of like a, I feel like, the similarity between them and like a dog face, like they feel like they're more of a collie. Um, and a lot of times for me, thinking about it in those terms, like comparing an animal to another animal just helps me think about like how I might draw it. Um, so let's see, we've got, and similar to the harbor seals, they also have pretty big eyes and they have external ear flaps. So we've got these little tiny ear flaps on the side. Yeah, there's a little nose up there. And vibrissae or whiskers for days. Similar thing to our harbor seals. Um, these friends use their whiskers in murky waters. And the waters aren't murky because they're dirty. Both of these animals live in waters that are incredibly plankton rich. So if you are from around Boston or the Northeast in general, you'll notice that in the summertime, our ocean water is kind of like deep blue green and you can't see very deep through it and that's because there's tons of plant plankton and animal plankton that is in the water and that makes it like an absolute all-you-can-eat buffet for a lot of migratory animals that spend their summers up here and we'll talk about whales in a little bit um, but sea turtles come up here um, lots of different types of fish and then even beyond animals that eat plankton there's you know you got your whole food web going on there if you've got a lot of animals munching on the plankton you've also got a lot of other animals munching on those animals um, so I, I have a lots of affection for our, our murky plankton rich waters and because they're that way, a lot of the animals that live in them, and this is similar for the fur seals living off the coast in the Northern Pacific, um, they are li living in water where it can be dark, hard to find prey, and those whiskers are great. And I know there's been scientific research done with how, how, like, how, um, detailed they can feel with their whiskers, and I'm pretty sure it's down to, like, the millimeter, like, they can sense very, very small differences with, with their whiskers, which is like, just, I don't know, it's just super cool. So we've got our first seal friend. Um, they're more related to sea lions. And in the aquarium, there's also some sea lions as well. Um, and those big differences that, that, that tell them apart from the harbor seals is again, being able to move on land pretty well. Um, really, really, really big front flippers and also pretty big back flippers. So let's do. Oh, and one of my other fur seal uh, fun facts is that they have an incredible size difference between the male fur seals and the female fur seals. So I'm going to see if I can illustrate that really quick, just small. And you'll see this sometimes in um, science illustrations where you'll have like a little silhouette, um, like maybe in, your, in a guidebook, 
and they'll show relative size to people. Um, but in this case, I want to do there's a little seal there. And this is just me like thinking about literally what the outs like what their silhouette looks like. And then the males can be a lot bigger. And this can be something that happens in some species. Other times the males and the females of the species look very similar. Um, a lot of it just depends on uh, behavior, uh, rearing of their young, all these different all these different factors kind of affect um, size differences. Let's get a little bit better. And that's I, I might actually be off with a little bit. might be a little bit bigger. <laughs> But I think the, the females uh, uh, clock in, I think at about around 150 pounds to 200, and I think the males can get up to 800 pounds. I can, you can double check my, it's been, it's been a little while since I reviewed my seal stats. Um, but it's a huge size difference, enough so that when, when people first started learning about fur seals, um, they thought that the male and female fur seals, northern fur seals, were actually two different species because they were so, so different in size. So and I'll shade that one in. Um, and sometimes for drawing purposes, it's actually really helpful to distill these animals into just their outline. Um, and I think, you know, there's all different ways to kind of approach like how how you draw and and the process and everything. And that's why I said in the beginning, there's like no right or wrong way to do this. It's mostly just like, just like ways I like to do that. So again, you might see that. I know the, I use the website allaboutbirds.org uh, and it's a really cool site for um, identifying birds. And they have a really cool graphic where they have, I think it's like sparrow, robin, crow, and I can't remember what the biggest one is, but it will show you whatever bird you're looking at, what it is relative to that size. And I find it's really helpful because it's hard to estimate size sometimes, especially from far away. Um, so let's see, for our fur seals, I wanted to do some swimming poses. Just because when they're swimming, they really make use of their front flippers. Um, so let's see. I've got. My, I'm, I'm referring to my little doodles, my little seal cheat sheets. Um, and yeah, normally what I would do is I would be using photos a bit more. And this is one of the other difficulties of live streaming through my computer is that I also use my computer for photo reference. Um, so sometimes it's a little tricky if I don't have the book for it. It means I can't share. Um, references and I feel like these seals are very they're very, very sleek um, and I kind of started out like a banana shape um, but this is more underwater I know we talked about the bananas before and just really big flippers and you can watch them swim there's a fun uh, on the aquariums YouTube there's a pretty cool video of fur seals in action both like just exploring in the shallow area and their exhibit but then also like swimming down deeper um, and it's just really fun to watch them to watch them move. And yeah, their their flippers are really, really fun. Now, if you were to take an x-ray of their flippers, and we'll do this on the whale, because I'll do x-ray view, um, they look very similar to our arm bones in the sense that there's one bone up at the top, two in kind of the forearm, and then a whole bunch, and actually like raised to have five digits in their flippers. They just have a very, very differently adapted limb to swim in the water. And we'll do this with the whales, because it's one of my favorite things. Like I just, I don't know, when I was a kid, I just figured whales were, the, the flipper parts were just like squishy and cartilage, but they have bones inside there. Um, and, and, I, and I was very surprised to find out that their bones were very similar to the number of bones that we have in our arms. So I think it's, it's kind of another like, fun reminder too of not just being mammals uh but also being vertebrates so animals that have a spinal column and a backbone um and i feel like i feel like i need to make this friend's head longer i think they have a longer neck than this and again this is me kind of like evaluating the drawing and being like that's a little better and we'll do big eyes And whiskers, these guys for days. What should we make this for this friend to? I think we should have it feeling a squid. Did squids last week? So. Maybe the squid doesn't know any better. The squid's like, ah, oh, that tickles. Oh no, you're gonna eat me. Oh dear. So let's do a. One more 
And I think I really like when these guys snooze. I think it's really fun to just like watch animals sleeping. I don't know why. Um, I don't know. It's this is kind of like comforting. So I want to draw one of the larger male fur seals just like taking a nice big snooze. So I feel like today's kind of like a snoozy, snoozy day. It's a little, if you're in the Northeast, it's dark and cloudy. Um, let me look at my nose again. I feel like I maybe. So I've basically just drawn an oval that has kind of a pointy part. It kind of looks like a potato. I mean, honestly, it's kind of potato-like. Um, I'm going to make that part a little bit more round. A little eye there. And then we'll do our flipper. And they have very floppity, floppity flippers. You know, maybe it wouldn't be up, up like that. Maybe it would just be flat on the ground. And again, this would be just kind of like, does this look right? Does this look right? And it's hard because it's, you know, doing it with my memory. We'll have a nice little, we'll have this one kind of flopping out, those little back flippers. And maybe this friend is snoring a little bit. So we'll do like maybe a, a slow rise because they're breathing. And then we'll have, again, kind of same thing, like really being very general with the rest of the body, but hyper-focusing on the face and paying a lot of attention to that part of the seal. Um, let's do a few more whiskers and some Zs. In cartoons, you can use Zs to show an animal is sleeping. Um, you can also have a little like balloon coming out of their nose. That's used more in the like manga, Japanese comics. Um, there's a couple different ways that we sig si signify sleeping. Um, and I don't actually, I guess the Zs are just supposed to be like onomatopoeia for snoring. Onomatopoeia is when a word sounds like the noise it's trying to, like, like crack. Or and in that case, like, zzz, it's more, I don't really snore like that. I feel like it's more of like, I actually really like to use the honk shoe, <laughs> where it's just honk and then shoo for, for my snoring. For my snoring, word balloon needs. Um, so yeah, for the fur seals, super dense fur that keep them insulated, um, because they're living in a really cold place, and then maneuverability on land with the way that their flippers are. Maybe we'll do one more fur seal. Actually, you know what? I'm going to move along, so we've got two whales today. But if anybody has any questions about the fur seals or drawing, again, please feel free to ask in the comment section. And we'll move along to humpback. What? Okie doke, thank you. Um, so... Humpback whales. Now, humpback whales are not necessarily coastal animals. You're going to find them a little bit further out because they are anywhere between 30 and 50 feet long. They're pretty big whales. And I actually think it's really hard to draw large animals unless you have something next to them. So I'm going to try my best to do just a humpback, but maybe we'll put in a diver or something like that to show. Or maybe we'll put in a seal. Um, but the humpback whales right now are off the coast of Massachusetts. Um, in a place called Stellwagen Bank, which is an incredibly, like like I said, kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet uh, for lots and lots of animals that come here in the summertime. So it's not just whales that are out there. Um, there are sharks, like basking sharks. There's mola molas, which are really big ocean sunfish. Um, there are sea turtles. There's just It's a big feeding frenzy. So we'll start with humpbacks. And they're kind of shaped like a half of an orange slice. So, or like a half circle. So I would say start with a half circle, kind of like a big smile. That's going to be our first shape for our whale friend. Now, humpback whales, their front flippers are about one third their body length. They have incredibly long front flippers. So we're going to put on, put those on too. And they're bumpy on one end and they're kind of shaped like, almost like strange butter knives or cheese knives. Um, so I'm like the animals are like, why do you keep describing our body parts and where's ways? I'm like, well, I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's hard to describe them. Um, and I feel like a lot of times when I draw humpback whales, I feel like I'm like, oh, that kind of looks wrong. But then I'm like, I see a picture of them and I'm like, nope, that is literally how big their front flippers are. And I think for the right whale, we'll do the x-ray vision. Um, actually, you know what? I don't like that back flipper. Sorry, back flipper. I'm going to draw you a little differently. 
I'm gonna make it just a little bit smaller just because it's slightly further away. And shrink it up there. And then I'm gonna pay attention a little bit more to the front. So this is gonna extend out a little bit more. And it's kind of blunt at the end. So we made our, our orange a little bit more that way and you know what, we'll work on the back tail as well. You know, I might have made I might have made my whale too big. That's okay. I mean they're just, just huge. So I'm gonna extend the back a little bit. And I'm gonna curve it. And I'm gonna have to shrink my whale. Just scoot it over a little bit. I will say that I know that I told you I like to draw on paper, um, but times like this makes my life a little bit easier when I'm like, oh no, I didn't leave room for the tail. Um and who hasn't? Who hasn't had that problem at some point? Very, very limited amount of the population. I forgot to leave room for the whale tail. Um, now, in fish, you see, if you're looking at the side view, their tails are like that. In marine mammals, their tails are flat. So it's kind of a big difference. So their 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 tail fins, their their tail flippers, the tails. Um, would instead of going sideways for their body, they would go up and down like that. And that's kind of a big, a big like difference in uh, whales versus fish. I will say that if you turn a whale sideways, so if you look at that same tail sideways, like you're underneath the whale on top of the whale, it will bend like that. But that's just the top view. So side views are always a little tricky, I think, for me. Um, because I'm always like, ah, I feel like the tail just looks a little strange. And you can, if you look at photos of whales, uh, you'll probably feel the same way. You're like, wait, that is a really strange way that their tail moves in the back. But again, it's mostly just because it's that kind of up and down motion with their body instead of that side to side motion. Um, I think I need a little bit more of a, a hump for their back right there, living up to that name. And humpback whales, so the, the, sorry, I finally remembered the name of the tail. It's the fluke on a whale. Um, it wasn't a fluke that I couldn't remember. Uh, humpback whales are actually identifiable by their flukes. So if you see a humpback whale with its tail, let's see, I'm going to erase this part, sticking out of the water. Turn this one sideways. Just pretend that this whale had just went on a dive. Usually they'll take their tail up. If you look at their fluke, each whale will actually have a different pattern of black and white on their fluke and you can identify them. Sometimes they're scarring as well. Um, but there's a whole directory of like, you can identify humpback whales just by their flukes, which is pretty cool. Um, a lot of times for scientists, we look to uh, ways to identify animals individually. And for right whales, which will be the last whale we talk about, I'll talk about um, how we identify them. So uh, humpback whales do have a small dorsal fin up on the top of their body, just a little itty bitty one. Not all whales have that dorsal fin. We'll see in the humpback next, or sorry, in the right whale next. And like I said, I like to spend a lot of time on the face. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit just to look at this whale's face. Um, one of the characteristics of humpbacks is that they have a lot of little bumps all along the front. So you can give that whale some little like, basically just C-shaped bumps. Um, it's kind of the textured, textured bumpy things on the front. And we are going to now do their mouth. Now I find that whales have pretty interesting mouths. Um, they look very different. And part of that is to allow, at least in baleen whales, the two ones we're gonna talk about, there's kind of two main types. There's baleen whales that have baleen in place of teeth, and there's tooth whales that have teeth, like a sperm whale or orca. Um, but baleen whales have a really cool, specially adapted mouth to catch and filter food with baleen. Um, so, Let's give this friend an eye. I have to go even, even, even smaller in for the eye. A little big whale eye. Now, if you were to see this whale's mouth open, um, I think that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to, I'm going to multiply this slide so I can still save it. Um, and I think what we'll do is I want to show you the baleen on a humpback whale. So I'm going to just, this is going to be like a little bit of like animating, animatory drawing. Um, humpback whales also have grooves on their throat that allow them to gulp huge amounts of water. So, um, let me uh, cut. 
paste. Again, this is going to be my attempt to animate this so that we can show you this whale with its mouth open. Um, this might be a fun thing to do is if you took your drawing and maybe did a flip book, like you can take, like with me, do the same drawing and maybe make like a little animation. Um, okay, so that's the bottom part of the mouth. And like I said, there's those throat grooves on the bottom. So what I'm going to do is erase through here. Together. And this whale has just gulped up a whole bunch of water. And in that water is tasty things like krill. Krill are a little type of shrimp-like animal. Um, and they're delicious for, for uh, humpback whales. Um, they also eat smaller fish called sand lance, which are these little like shiny, shiny fishies. Um, oh, and let's see if I can remember. I'm pretty sure that the baleen is on the top. And this is kind of what baleen looks like. It's almost like if you zoomed in and it looks like a, a almost like a plastic comb or like 10 plastic combs all sandwiched together. Baleen itself is a material that's made out of the same stuff as your fingernails. It's kind of flexible, almost like a, like a broom. Um, and what it allows whales to do is filter feed so they can take a huge gulp of water. We'll put some water, and we'll put some krill in there. So much krill. Krill party. I mean, not a real, it's not really a party for the krill, actually. <laughs> They're going to get eaten. Um, but hey, circle of life. Um, and what the baleen allows the way to do is to suck in all this water with potential food in it and then push the extra water out the baleen while trapping all the krill inside against the baleen. Um, it'd be kind of like if you, uh, I can squirt water through my front teeth because I have a pretty big gap between there. So it's like if I was having a bowl of Cheerios and I just wanted to eat the Cheerios and not the milk and I took a spoonful and then squirted all the milk out and kept the Cheerios. That's gross. Don't do that. The milk's good. Like just don't do, don't do that. Don't try that. But it, it would be like if that's how we had to eat our food. So it's just a really neat way for uh, whales to to catch and eat food. You know what? We can make this three dimensional. Put a little whale tongue in there. Whoa, this is delicious. Um, and the baleen kind of fits on the side when they close their mouth. Now, humpback whales right now in the Spellwagon Bank have to eat around uh, 3,000 pounds of food a day to maintain their whale-like physique. Um, and they do this for four, five, six months out of the year. They just eat, like it's at all you can eat buffet. And then for the winter, they actually go down to the Caribbean and hang out in warmer waters. Now, the only problem with that is that there's no food for them in those waters. So they're basically eating all the food they need for a year um, when they're up here off the coast of New England and then going down to warmer, warmer, warmer waters just to survive in while it's warmer or to have their calves and raise their calves and then bring them back up when it gets to be summer up here. Um, so it's kind of an amazing migration. It's, it's, it's incredible. So we have both of our whale eating, and I'll see if I can, uh, let's see if I can do it so that it kind of looks like a cartoon. I can't really do it, but, um, but yeah, it's, again, thinking about behavior and finding ways to illustrate that. So we're going to do, uh, jump to our last animal, a right whale. And again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to focus on the right whale next, and then we'll wrap it up. Whale. Now, right whales, I think of all the animals we've drawn today, are one of the hardest whales for me to draw because I think their body is very different than what I think of when I think of a whale. So we're going to start with our <clears throat> similar shape to our, our uh, humpback, but more stout. These whales are, are pretty, like, stocky. Um, And they have an incredible amount of baleen. Um, we'll talk about their baleen a little bit once we get their whole body done. But they eat even smaller food than the humpback whales. They eat um, plankton and copepods, like little, little tiny things. And I can't imagine, like, it would just be, it would be something else to be like a whale that is this big, like 40 feet long in the ocean, and you eat the tiniest food. And I know there's, you know, there's other animals that do that too, a lot of, a lot of large plankton. Planktonic, uh, planktonic feeders, so like whale sharks are another, not a whale, it's a shark, but it's big, um, are another animal that, that survives on plankton. Um, it's just kind of, it's kind of awesome. 
Um, so we're going to draw maybe like a little triangle in the back here for our back part. And they'll draw their, their tail to flip up like that. They, in addition to having a stocky body, um, they also have pretty stocky fins and, sorry, flippers. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that one. Not fins, flippers. Um, so let's connect this down here. We've got uh, our front pectoral flippers down here. And again, they're kind of like very short, especially compared to the humpback whale that we just drew. Um, very short paddly ones. And we'll zoom in and we'll do the x-ray view on that. I'm going to make sure I have enough time for that. Um, and hump, uh, right whales do not have any dorsal fins. There's no little dorsal fins on top. And you know what? I think I think I didn't give their mouth enough space. So I'm going to move our pectoral flipper back just a little bit. I would erase if it were faster, but it's not at the moment. And their mouths are are pretty incredible. So we're going to start up here. Take a big hook down. It's kind of like the letter J. And all in there is really, really long plankton that they're going to use to strain food. Now their eyes down at the bottom. And one of the factors, characteristics that allows uh, scientists to identify right whales are callosities. And callosities are these little white bumps that are found um, a lot of times on their, their fluke, on their tail, or on the front of their body. And they're kind of like little, not necessarily scars, but they're like little rough patches of skin. Um, and each right whale has a different pattern of callosities. So if you look at a right whale from above, we'll do just a very quick right whale, right whale from above drawing. Zoom into their face. I'm trying to remember what they're. I think it's pretty much what they look like from above. I might have this wrong. This is the, this is a situation where it's, it would be helpful for me to have a top-down picture, but a little bit further down like that. Um, they have a double blowhole. On top. So I wouldn't even talk about blowholes on the other one. That's how whales breathe air. It's basically like, imagine if you took your nose and put it on the top of your head. Um, that's what a blowhole's like. And some whales have a singular singular hole, um, so like uh, dolphins do, but right whales have two. Um, and I know that because when I first learned to identify whales from afar, when they have a spout, their spout looks like a V. They have like that. Um, eyes there. So all those callosities will have a different pattern for each right whale, and there's actually a binder that has all the different right whales in it. Um, now, that might seem overwhelming, but one of the kind of bummer things about right whales is there's only about 400 of them left. Um, they're incredibly endangered. They were one of the most popular whales to be hunted when whaling was a huge industry, and their population didn't really ever recover. And they're, they're, even though whaling doesn't happen anymore as an industry, uh, they are susceptible to boat strikes. So any places where there's big boats going through, um, these whales feed on plankton, which is usually at the surface. And if they're where they are feeding, they're they're prone to being hit by boats. So I know the aquariums worked really hard uh, with other organizations to try and change shipping routes or study these whales so we know where the whales are so we can have boats avoid them because that would minimize uh, boat strikes and, and injuring or killing these animals. Um, the other thing is entanglement, and there's a lot of leftover gear in the ocean, whether it's nets or buoy lines, um, that these whales can get tangled up in. And it's not their fault. Normally, you wouldn't have lines in the ocean like that, and they don't have opposable thumbs or anything. They can't really entangle themselves. So cutting down on marine debris and helping figure out where the safest place for boats to go so they can avoid whales are kind of uh, policies that can help protect these whales. And we're definitely not done doing that. Um, this is not, it's not like you make a rule and it's done. It's like an ongoing, an ongoing thing to try and help these whales uh, because they're an important part of the food web. And I don't know, I think we have a responsibility to uh, protect our animal friends, especially if a lot of our activities are things that are getting them hurt. So I think, you know, part of the goal is to live uh, in 
harmony the best we can with the other animals on this planet. And I think that because humans think a lot about this, uh, we, again, we have that responsibility. And sometimes it can feel like, wait, me, I have it. I mean, like collectively all have it. And one of the biggest steps to learning about how to protect these animals is just learning about them. So you're already today ch chatting and drawing with me, learning about uh, right whales and how we've taken steps to protect them and how we can do stuff in the future. Uh, I know the aquarium on their website has additional resources. So if you want to check out, I think if you just check out neaq.org and look under right whales, there's a whole program where you can learn about the research being done. Uh, moment before we end to zoom into their zoom into their flippers for a little x-ray visit because this is one of my favorite parts so we've got one bone here two bones here and then we pretty much have kind of looks like our our own hands in there and i said they don't have opposable thumbs but they do have the bones for hands which is not hands but they have very similar bones to what we have and i just thought that was like the coolest thing that you know that's inside their their flippers. Um, whale skeletons are, are awesome. And that's usually a lot of times for people, the first introduction to a whale, if you've ever been in a uh, natural history museum or even in the aquarium, the aquarium has a right whale skeleton hanging in the building. Um, and I feel like that's usually our first our first relationship to, to those animals. Um, and it's really special to get to see them in the wild and not everybody can. And that's why I say the internet is like one of the best resources. So if you're interested in watching whales in the wild, um, check out the aquarium's website and then also just like do a little do a little research at different aquariums or different um whale scientists are another great place to look and i know the aquarium has a bunch of active scientists studying right whales and a lot of times they have blog posts about what their research is like and how they learn not just um how to identify white whales but how to get really cool medical information and dna and track families so there's like endless cool stuff about about whales um does anybody have any questions before we wrap up today Okay, go. Well, I will end today by saying thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure for me to come and be a guest and do live draws at the aquarium just because it's a really cool institution. It's a great resource. And um, the time that I spent there as an educator definitely shaped shaped my path for, for, for the best. Um, and if you can, uh, you can check out the aquarium's website, learn some more stuff. And if you are able to, uh, and can donate. Uh, it's definitely a difficult time right now for a lot of institutions that we love, like zoos and aquariums and museums. And like I said, if you can, but if you can't, um, check out some of the cool programming, the stay at home programming. There's virtual visits every day at the aquarium. They've done a lot of really cool special and uh, like Q and A's with scientists. Um, so there's lots of different ways to engage with the aquarium, even if we, we can't physically go there. And uh, thank you all so much for drawing marine mammals with this mammal today.